Hi folks, I'm Dr. Smith from Texas Tech Musicology. This is a short video lecture on the traditions of the New Orleans brass and street bands. It takes a kind of historiographic approach, looking at where those bands came from and the various traditions that contributed to the way they play in contemporary New Orleans. It also cites some of the current bands involved with the revival of brass band music, especially since the 1970s, and with a particular focus upon the great Dirty Dozen Brass Band, who were a leader in that revival. I'm going to suggest that the New Orleans Brass Band tradition, as is the case in other cities, colonial cities around the Caribbean, is a product really of two kinds of meetings. The meetings on the one side of European fife and drum and then brass band traditions, which were originally associated with military bands signaling on the field of battle, going really all the way back to the 17th century. That gives us some of the instrumentation, it gives us some of the military associations, some of the marches and genres of pieces that are played. But then the other tradition, which is very important in New Orleans and in similar kinds of what we call syncretic brass band traditions, is the traditions of the African Caribbean, particularly of improvisation and playing by ear. And in New Orleans, which is the most Caribbean of all North American cities, a place where European and Afro-Caribbean music traditions really met, we get this very unique synthesis. And it's precipitated, and it's accelerated, and then it reaches watersheds at certain historical moments. And I'll speak about those briefly. You can see the still here from the YouTube video. This is a modern ensemble playing in late 18th century style. It's a group associated with Fort York in Canada, and they are playing what's essentially fife and drum music. This is music that was as intended, as I said, to be used in the field of battle for signaling, but then also outside of the field of battle, this, these kinds of bands would also play for patriotic occasions and marching, and sometimes even for dancing and for listening. So uh, if you'll go over to the YouTube video right now, you can kind of sample this and uh, check out what I mean by 18th century fife and drum style. And so you kind of get the picture there. You'll notice uh, various things about the instrumental style, about the technique, about the instruments that are used, about the range of the fifes, which are a simple system, transverse flute, uh, the types of tunes that are used, and the way that a tune like Yankee Doodle is adapted. A little bit later into the early 19th century, we get this next example. This is music which is associated particularly with the War of 1812 in uh, in the U.S. South, which culminated in the year 1815 at the Battle of New Orleans, whose victor was the American general, um, Andrew Jackson. You'll notice there's a little bit more going on here in terms of instrumentation. We also have these uh, brass, simple uh, trumpets, um, non-keyed trumpets and bugles, uh, still the use of the side drum, still very much associated with signaling and marching on the field of battle. So this is a Napoleonic bugle march from around the year 1815.
So you kind of get the picture there as well. They're now using brass instruments. These are bugles, which have no keys, which still play essentially in the overtone series, still very much something that's associated with coordinated movement on the field of battle or in the line of march in a military setting. And of course, that's one of the places where the military tradition, which we still associate with many marching bands in North America, comes from. But there's another thing to be observed here, which is that after many international conflicts, particularly from the 18th century onward, two things resulted when those wars ended. One was that you had large collections of people who had learned their music in the military. Maybe they got their military music training only as part of their service, whether they were drummers or fifers or trumpeters. They were people who were trained in music in a military setting. And so when they came out of those settings, when they came back to uh, peacetime, and civilian life, of course, they brought that training with them. The other thing that came out of those same kinds of settings was instruments themselves. Every regiment, every military unit in a standing army, whether it was a European army, a British army, a North American army, or a Caribbean army, every one of those units had its own band of sorts, fives and drums, trumpets and drums, or those bands expanded. And that meant not only did people receive training, but also that musical instruments came back into the population. So after the War of 1812, after the American Civil War in the 1860s, after the Spanish-American War in the 1890s, and after the First World War in the 19 teens, in each case, people would come out of those, come out of service when they had finished their military service. Some of them were trained in music and Tuck brought that training in music back to their own homes. And also musical instruments were surplus. And so the availability of inexpensive used brass band instruments became greater and greater over the course of the 19th and into the early 20th, early 20th century. So I'm going to go on to my next example. This is uh, an ensemble playing, obviously, as you can tell, in a reconstruction of U.S. Civil War style. They're associated with the uh, hobby of reenacting of costuming and recreating the life of the camps and of the battlefield in the U.S. Civil War from 1861 to 1865. If you're a musician, you'll notice that there's some peculiarities about these instruments. These are instruments which are specifically in particular kinds of designs to facilitate playing in matched groups, in consorts, and also to facilitate marching. And you can probably make some judgments about exactly why those instruments were adapted the way they were to facilitate those uses. But it should be emphasized that in both the Union Army and the Confederate Army, every regimental band had a band director, had a collection of instruments, had a collection of musicians who had often been trained in the military band, and they were used not only to play on the field of battle, in fact, by the Civil War, very often bandsmen, so-called the musicians of the brass bands, they actually served as medics and stretcher carriers during combat. But uh, they also played for all manner of other kinds of settings, for parades and during the march and for listening and for dancing and in concerts and even in theaters for uh, opera and things of that sort. So this is a repertoire that's associated with U the Union armies and Confederate armies, Civil War bands. These are reconstructions of instruments. Some of them actually have been based upon instruments which were recovered from battlefield. And they're playing in this mid 19th century U.S. brass band style.
So obviously that's a, a much more uh, completely and meticulously arranged kind of brass band music with multiple parts, multiple sections, very much a kind of listening music. That's not marching music, that's music for listening and for concertizing. You'll also notice that the instruments are employed in a certain fashion and that they're in fact some instruments whose particular design may not previously have been familiar to you. Uh, the thing to remember here is that this is the one of the most significant, most central forms of instrumental ensemble in 19th century America was the brass band, whether they were playing in military contexts or civilian contexts, whether they're playing on the battlefield or on the field of march or for listening or for dancing or for theater music. So it's a very common kind of sound and the music was absolutely ubiquitous. We're still talking primarily about essentially a European musical tradition, right? One that's uh, inherited from the Renaissance and Baroque era military fife and drum bands and from the loud bands of the city musicians of the Renaissance. But when this tradition comes to North America with white settler culture and it's disseminated during these wars and through this kind of training, it also meets up with some other kinds of music, particularly in the Caribbean and particularly in New Orleans, the most Caribbean of North American cities. So I want to go to talking a little bit about Caribbean music for brass and brass like instruments now. This is a style of music called Rara, which comes from Haiti. Rara itself is the name of a festival. It starts out originally as a, a rural festival, the kind of thing that people in the hills played in Haiti. Uh, from the late 18th century onward, they played a variety of different kinds of instruments, many of them made of bamboo. They were what we would call simple trumpets. Um, a bamboo would be hollowed and then a mouthpiece built and you would play it rather as if you were playing trombone or didgeridoo. Uh, and they were called vaccine. Or, or tambu, which is in the Haitian Creole language. But then that music comes down out of the hills and it's very much associated with Haitian carnival. And it begins to be played on brass band instruments that have been borrowed from colonial, particularly from French colonial sources. So this is festival music, which is music that's associated with the festival specifically of carnival. It uses both bamboo and, tuck and uh, vaccine, but it also uses some brass instruments. And you'll hear it's a quite different kind of musical approach. But one of the things that's connecting it is both the experience of history of European settlers in Caribbean islands, of African and Afro-Caribbean people picking up on these instruments, playing music that's associated with their own festival traditions. And we get this kind of meeting place, this synthesis of several different kinds of wind band music. So this is Ra Ra from Haiti.
So that's a, a much more rhythmically involved and polyrhythmic music. You can hear lots of improvisation going on, both in terms of how the rhythmic instruments are playing and how the horns are trading off. You see a mixture of Western percussion, like the marching snare, but also African barrel drums. You see a combination of those bamboo, or in this case, PVC, simple trumpets that are made kind of like a didgeridoo, plus things like saxophone and uh, the valve trumpet. And this is very much this ensemble and the sound of this ensemble. It's combinations of musical elements and combination of instrumental elements. It's very much a reflection of a kind of meeting that happened with a lot of difficult history, a lot of painful history in the Caribbean between European settler culture, particularly English, Spanish, and French, and African and African diasporic musical approaches as well. So that's rara music from Haiti in the Caribbean. And there's a very strong Haitian music influence that comes into New Orleans because they're both Caribbean cities. And it happens at certain times as a result of certain kinds of transformations and diasporas, particularly of people leaving Haiti, which was a French-speaking nation, and coming to New Orleans, which for most of its history was a French-speaking city. And so we get this meeting, and in that meeting we get these new ways of thinking about music making in a kind of syncretic way in the city of New Orleans. Uh, I'm going to speak next about a kind of classic uh, approach to brass band playing in New Orleans. Brass bands are extremely important in New Orleans. They've been important in New Orleans really ever since the Civil War, certainly for reasons that I've previously mentioned, particularly by the uh, mid early to mid 20th century, you have a tradition of brass bands who parade and they parade for all kinds of reasons. They parade during carnival and during other kinds of festive celebrations. They play for listening. They sometimes play for dancing. They play in the parks, they play for holidays, but they're particularly associated with this way of sending someone off at the end of a life as part of a New Orleans funeral. And the classic approach is captured in this film clip, which is actually from a classic film about New Orleans music from 1978 called Always for Pleasure. This sequence is about a brass band funeral. The person has been has been um, shriven and has been embalmed and they're in the coffin and they've been at the church and there's been a funeral mass because this is largely a Catholic tradition. And they've been, the coffin has been placed into the hearse and the band is going to accompany the march from the church to the graveyard. And they're going to play um, tunes by ear in an improvisational fashion that are kind of suitable for that purpose. But then afterwards, at the end of that service at the graveside, they're going to turn around and they're going to lead the mourners back to the church or back to a, a place for a, for a party. And there they're going to play up-tempo music and they're going to be followed by dancers who are called the second line. So a New Orleans brass band funeral parade, sometimes it's called a jazz funeral, is there's a mass at the church, slow music to take you to the graveyard, a mass at the graveside, and then quick step music for the second line dancers to take you back for a big party. So this is from the classic film, Always for Pleasure, The End of a Perfect Death.
the second line. It's a wonderful film. It's definitely worth checking out. Oh, it's called Always for Pleasure from 1978. So that's a tradition that continues, and it continues uh, even into the more modern era from the 1970s onward. By the 1970s, late 70s, early 1980s, however, you're starting to see some other musics come into the mix, younger musicians who decide that they still want to play in the brass band style. They will still want to play by ear. They still want to parade. They still want to play in the street. They want to play for the second line dancers. But they're also listening to, to other music. They're listening to more modern jazz. They're listening to funk. Eventually, hip hop comes into the mix as well. And they begin playing those tunes and especially they begin playing those rhythms, but still using the basic instrumentation of the New Orleans street band, brass, reeds and percussion, marching snare, marching bass drum and hi-hat cymbal. So it's very much a similar kind of instrumentation, but new grooves, especially modern jazz and funk grooves, especially. And these are our, our titular artists for this presentation. This is the great Dirty Dozen Brass Band who I became aware of, I think, first in the early 1980s when I began hearing their records, and particularly this particular recording of a tune called Feats Don't Fail Me Now.
I kind of hate to fade that because it's such great playing, such great music. That's uh, that's the Dirty Dozen Brass Band, about the time that I first started hearing them. And you can hear that in addition to being music that uses some new kinds of grooves, it uses funk grooves and Afro-Caribbean grooves and uh, calypso grooves, and eventually we'll get to hip hop. There's also real stamina, really tremendous skillfully playing, skillful playing there. And don't forget that some of these bands will march for a second line for two or three or four hours on, say, a Mardi Gras Sunday or Super Bowl Sunday. So you need stamina. You brass players will understand. And you need stamina of a very, very high order. So this is a real kind of revival and a real, real reimagination of the way that the brass band can work in New Orleans music as these other kinds of musical styles, and especially grooves, enter the mix. So if I take us forward, I'm going to play just a short excerpt of this. This is from another one of the great New Orleans bands who are now darn near as venerable as the Dirty Dozen. This is one of my favorite bands, along with the Dirty Dozen, who I heard first. These are a couple of musicians from the Rebirth Brass Band, and they're giving a little bit of a workshop for one of the high schools, I think, in New Orleans. And if you know about New Orleans music, you'll know that many of those musicians got their start playing in high school bands, high school jazz bands, high school marching bands, and that band directors in New Orleans high schools and black neighborhoods are incredibly important, incredibly influential, and they're really the people who who create the launch pad for a lot of the great musicians who have come out of New Orleans. So just a brief excerpt. This is Keith Frazier and Derek Tabb from the Rebirth Brass Band in a workshop where they're mostly talking about snare drum styles, but you can get a feel about some of the kinds of performance practice that are involved in this music.
It's great music. And as uh, as the band members were saying, you know, this is a music that's very much by ear. You learn it and teach it and pass it on by ear and in the memory. Oftentimes you learn it from older musicians. Some of these players have been playing in brass bands their whole lives since they were small kids, playing in their in their school bands or playing their school bands that would then go out and play for the parades and that kind of thing. So it's a very rich, very living tradition, the New Orleans brass band tradition. I've got a couple more excerpts in this um, slideshow and a couple more things I could point you to in the playlist. This is a really great performance actually from a television series also featuring Rebirth. Um, it's a second line, much more recent approach to the second line from the early, from the mid 2000s. It's well worth checking out on YouTube or in that playlist. And the, the kind of the takeaway here is that this is a tradition which emerges out of a particular time and place, combination of human experiences, the collision of different kinds of musical and cultural traditions, French, Spanish, English speaking, particularly strongly Afro-Caribbean and especially from Haiti. And all of that continues to swirl around and be shared and to evolve and to create new styles as new players come up and new genres and new grooves come into the music. And even after Katrina, even after the storm, which was such a devastating event in the early 2000s, nearly nearly destroyed New Orleans street culture because it, it hit working class neighborhoods so strong. The brass bands have been an incredibly important part of bringing back uh, the street playing and the parades and the second lines and the festival events uh, for which they've always been the soundtrack. And so culture has been a tool, particularly music culture and specifically the music culture of the New Orleans street bands has been an essential way of kind of rebuilding society in New Orleans after several real tough storms and all kinds of tough political events. And uh, it's, it reminds us that street culture and vernacular culture and the music that people play in the home, that they learn from their families, that they learn going by in the streets outside, that's an incredibly powerful tool for positive social good. And uh, so I just feel really fortunate to have encountered the New Orleans brass band tradition when I did the Dirty Dozen brass band when I first heard them, to have heard them play in New Orleans and to be aware that music this beautiful and this powerful and this positive is still out there. So I hope you enjoyed this. Feel free to check it out. Uh, there's a wealth of great music out there. And I'll see you soon. Bye.